Welcome to lecture 5.5, p-groups. Before we begin, I want to advertise and plug what's coming soon on something known as the CELO theorems. And I mentioned this briefly in the previous lecture. First, we need a definition, which is the title of this lecture. A p-group is a group whose order is a power of a prime p. A p-group that is a subgroup of another group, G, is called a p-subgroup of G. So notice I say power of a prime. If it were just prime, it would be a cyclic group. But it's not, necessarily. Throughout this lecture and the remaining lectures of this section, G will be a group of order p to the n, for some prime, times m, where p does not divide that m. In other words, we're going to pick a prime p, and p to the n is the highest power of p that divides the order of the group. Now if p doesn't divide the order in the group, then n is 0. Except we're not ever going to consider that case, because it gets boring pretty quickly. So we're just going to assume that p is a prime that divides the order of the group. And this is the largest power of that prime that does. There are three CELO theorems, and loosely speaking, they describe the following about a group's P subgroups. First, the existence of them, and I mentioned this in the previous lecture. In every group, P subgroups of all possible sizes exist. So we've seen by Cayley's theorem that there will be a subgroup of order P, but now we know that there will be one as well as of, of order p squared, p cubed, and s as big as we can get, so that p to the n divides the order of g. The second CELA theorem tells us about the relationship of these p subgroups. And th this is easy to state. It says all maximal p subgroups are conjugate. And finally, the last CELA theorem tells us something about the number of such p subgroups. And I'm not going to state it, but I'm just going to say that there are very strong restrictions on how many p subgroups a group can have. And together, these place strong restrictions on the structure of a group G with a fixed order. And that's the point of the CELO theorems, is it will really help us understand the structure of finite non-abelian groups because we fully understand the structure of finite abelian groups. Before we can introduce the CELA theorems, we need to better understand p groups. Recall that a p group is any group of order p to the n. For example, the trivial group C1, or C4, this is order 2 squared. This is V4, that's a p group, that has order 2 squared. D4 has order 8 as does q4, 8 is a power of 2. These things are all two groups. Here's something I'm going to call the p-group lemma. If a p-group g acts on a set, s, so here's the action, let's call it phi, then the number of fixed points of the action is congruent to the order of the set modulo p. That's what this means. Now this is very similar to something that we saw in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we said if a group of order p acts on a set, then this holds. But this is saying if a group of a prime power order acts on a set, then the same thing still holds. And the proof is almost the same. As before, I will sketch it. Let's suppose that the order of g is p to the n. By the orbit stabilizer theorem, the only possible orbit sizes are one p, p are, are powers of p, possibly p to the zero, which is one. So here's a picture of the orbit diagram or the action diagram. So there's going to be a whole bunch of these guys that fall into orbits that are powers of p, and p to the k for some positive integer k. These are the non-fixed points, and then everything else is a fixed point. So the, the order of these 
each of these orbits is d divisible by p. So if you take the number, the total number of points modulo p, you can just get rid of all of these size p to the k orbits and just look at the fixed points. And that's exactly what this lemma says. So I'll let you write this up formally if you need to practice, but hopefully it should be clear by the picture why this is true, just like it was clear by the same picture, almost the same picture, in the previous lecture. Okay, so continuing on, let's, uh, let's do a couple of lemmas on P groups. Actually, I guess I call this a single lemma, but I've broken it into two parts. So I call it the normalizer lemma. If H is a P subgroup of G, that means it's a subgroup of G, and it has prime power order, then, this is curious, the index of H in the normalizer of H is congruent to the index of H in G. It's congruent modulo P. So a picture of it, a quick picture of this is here's H. Now the normalizer is a set of all elements in the group that normalize H, meaning when you conjugate H by it, you get back itself. So here's the normalizer. Normalizer. And of course this thing lies in the whole group G. So this is saying that the that this index is the number of cosets of H in the normalizer. And on the right hand side this says the number of cosets of H in G. I don't know how that much that helped, but we'll see more pictures after we do the proof. The proof isn't that long. We can fit in, in the remainder of this slide. Okay, so let's let S be the set G mod H. In other words, the set of right cosets of H, here's a key, in G. Not in the normalizer, but in G. So how many right cosets do we have? How big is this set? Right here. It's the index of H in G. Now, the group H, yes, that's right, H not G. The group H acts on S by right multiplication. That means we have a homomorphism from H to the permutations of S defined as follows. Phi of H, meaning pressing the H button, is the permutation that sends each right coset HX to HXH. Well, that works. That's certainly an action. And of course we can define the whole group G to act on S similarly like this, but we don't need to. This is actually the action that's going to make things work out. And that is in no way clear up front. Most of these proofs that you'll see via these clever group actions are should not be clear to anybody that this is what you should try. But I'm showing you them almost as, as like black magic. It's like they do work at some point someone figure this out. Um, but a lot of the other things in the class, when I give you a proof, it, a lot of times you can follow your nose and use your intuition and get the right, right answer. A lot of these, once I give you the action, maybe you can do it, but you're not going to think of this action right away. Absolutely not. Okay, so we have the, the action, right? This, the subgroup, the group H, that is the subgroup, acts on its right cosets by right multiplication. Now, I claim that the fixed points of this action are the right cosets. Uh, the fixed points are going to be elements in the set, so they will be right cosets. And I claim that they are the right cosets that are in the normalizer. Now, remember that the normalizer is a subgroup that contains H. And when we studied it, we proved that the normalizer is a union of cosets. So in other words, if we look at the right cosets, of H. So there's H, there's HX, and then there might be like HY, and there's a bunch of others. And then if we look to the left cosets, these were H, these were XH, and then maybe we had YH, and then we had others. I think back then I labeled the left cosets that were also right cosets in red. 
And then the left cosets that were not right cosets, I would label them in blue. Like here's the right coset that is not its left coset. And then the normalizer, if you remember, the normalizer was the collection, or is the union of the elements in the cosets that voted yes. So this is the normalizer of, of H and G. So technically it's a union of the elements in here, but since our set consists of cosets and we're looking for the fixed points, I'm claiming that the fixed points are precisely the right cosets that voted yes, the ones in the normalizer. Okay, so let's prove this. So what does it mean for a, coset, a right coset to be a fixed point of this action? That means that hx times an element little h is hx for all elements in h. Right? So we have this, this equation holds for all little h. And that's equivalent, if we just move this x over to the left-hand side, to h little x, h little x inverse, this right coset equaling h for all elements in h. And of course, that happens if and only if this element is in h. All right, this right coset is equal to h if and only if the representative is in h. So let's write that next. That's if and only if x, h, x inverse is in our subgroup for all little h in our subgroup. And what does that mean? Well, that means that x normalizes h. Because x, that's exactly what it means to normalize h. And yeah, that's what we said. So x is in the normalizer or equivalently, the entire right coset, hx, is in the normalizer if and only if that right coset is a fixed point of the action. Therefore, the number of fixed points of phi, in other words, the number of cosets in the normalizer, well, this, that's the definition of index. It's the index of h in the normalizer. That's exactly what index means the number of cosets of this group and that group. So we know that. And we also know, I pointed this out right away, that since S is a set of right cosets, the size of S is just the number of right cosets, which is the index of H and G. So the order of S equals the index of H and G. By our P group lemma, this quantity, the number of fixed points, is equivalent to the size of the set, modulo p. And therefore, we have this quantity, the index of h in the normalizer, is equivalent mod p to the index of h in g. And that's it. We're done. Here is a picture of the action of the p subgroup h on its set of right cosets from the proof of the normalizer lemma in the previous slide. So recall that the normalizer lemma says that the, normali the normalizer of H and G, take that group, and that contains H. So the index of H in its normalizer is equivalent to the index of H in G mod P. So the number of cosets of H in G, that is all of these dots here. That's our entire set, all of these dots. And so if we reduce this modulo P, in this case, P is going to be 3 because we have orbits of size 3 to the first and 3 squared. So th this number reduced modulo 3, you can get rid of all of these because they are multiples of 3. Well, that mod, mod 3 is equal to these many dots, modulo 3, as well. Because, again, we can just ignore all of these, and that, that's what this is here. This is the index of H in the normalizer. And so this really is no different than that picture that I showed you earlier in this chapter, uh, proving the p-grip lemma, and also, uh, I said chapter, I mean lecture, also in the previous lecture, proving the same a special case of that. So, again, everything here, these are the orbits of of size greater than 1. These are the 
right cosets that are not left cosets, and these things here are the right cosets that are left cosets. We will conclude this lecture with a result that will be very useful in proving the first CeeLo theorem. And I'm going to call it the normalizer lemma part two. And again, this is my own term. I didn't get this from a book. But I, I call it this because part one is similar and it is used to prove part two. And part two is the one that will be useful in proving the first CeeLo theorem. And if you put them together, part one plus part two, it just becomes too complicated. Okay, so let's, let's move on. So the order of a group G is P to the N times M. And remember, P to the N, by assumption, this is the largest power of P that divides the order of G. And H is a subgroup of G. It's a P subgroup, so its order is a power of P, but it's not a maximal power of P. It's strictly smaller than P to the N. Then we claim that H is strictly contained in its normalizer. And moreover, the index of H in its normalizer is a multiple of P. Well, it can't be 1, because this is a strict containment in that. So we claim it's a multiple of P. Here is a picture that should hopefully describe everything in this lemma. So let's start here on the left. The normalizer of H is always between H and G. That's always the case. Now sometimes equality might hold in one of these, or might not. But here in this lemma we are saying that equality cannot hold right here. This has to be strict. So what that means down here is that means that there is strictly more than one coset of H in the normalizer. So these red cosets, these are the right cosets that are also left cosets. They are in the normalizer. These blue cosets, these are the right cosets that are not left cosets. So there, there is a multiple of P of these cosets because the index is a multiple of P. So that means that these red cosets will be a multiple of P. And then I also claim that the total number of cosets of H and G, that's the index of H and G, that will be a multiple of P as well. And let's see why. So the index of H and G is, of course, the order of G divided by the order of H. Let's see what that is. So the order of G is P to the N times M. And the order of H is P to the I. And we are assuming that P to the I is less than P to the N. So this is going to be P to the N minus I. That's going to be a positive power of P times M. So the number of cosets of H and G is some power of P times M. So in other words, this number of cosets is a multiple of P. And that pretty much tells us this, this is a picture for every piece of this. H is strictly contained in the normalizer. And that's here. And that also means that there's more than one coset. The index is a multiple of P. So there's a multiple of P cosets. And because this is strict, that means the no total number of cosets is also a multiple of P. Now conclusions. Well, as we said, H cannot be the normalizer. That's impossible. And also, P to the I plus 1 divides the order of the normalizer. Well, why is that? Well, how big is the normalizer? Well, there are P to the I elements in each of these, and there is some multiple of P of those. So that's whatever multiple of P, that is, times P to the I is a multiple of P to the I plus 1. Now that we better understand part 2 of the normalizer lemma using our picture, well, let's prove it. To begin, we have a subgroup H that is normal in its normalizer. That's, remember, that's always the case. And therefore, we can create a quotient map. We can quotient out by H. Formally, that means we have a homomorphism from the normalizer of H to the normalizer of H mod H. And how are we going to define this? Well, it's a quotient. It's a canonical quotient. So we just take an element in here, call it a little g, 
and send it to an element, a coset of the normalizer, which is GH. Now, H is a normal subgroup, so every left coset is a right coset, so it doesn't matter if I denote this as a left or a right coset, so I'll denote it as a left coset. Oh, why not? Now, the size of the quotient group. The size of this quotient group is, of course, the index of H in the normalizer, because this is a group of cosets, and this is how many cosets there are, by definition. It's the number of cosets of H in the normalizer. And by the normalizer lemma, part one, this quantity is congruent modulo P to the number of cosets of H in G. But by Lagrange's theorem, well, this first part is just this copy and pasted down here. So, by Lag so Lagrange's theorem is actually this equality. The index of H in G is the order of G divided by the order of H. And that is P to the N times M divided by P to the I. Remember, I is less than N. So that's P to the N minus I times M, which is equivalent to 0 mod P, because this is a multiple of P. And I claim this proves it. Because this quantity, the number of cosets of H in the normalizer, we just proved is a multiple of P. Well, why? Because we proved it's congruent modulo P to 0. So it can't be 1. These things would be the same if and only if this index were to be 1. So the normalizer must be strictly larger than H. And that's all we had to prove. We're done.